Hello everyone and welcome to our digital installment of our pre-concert talks. We are so excited to have with us our new chief conductor, Maestro Hans Graf, with us this afternoon. Today we are going to start off first uh, talking about a very special composer to Maestro's heart, which is Debussy. So Maestro, can you share with us a little bit about this very special piece that we're doing? So I'm very happy to be here that the Singapore Symphony managed to get all the things done to make music possible again, really played by real people sitting almost together in a concert venue. The first piece is rather, as Hakpeng said, unusual. It's the string quartet, the only string quartet by Claude Debussy. He was 31, looking back already on quite a wealth of compositions, coming out of French romantic music. And in a way, sounds strange, this string quartet is his only symphonic piece. What is symphonic? First movement, scherzo, slow movement, finale. Like the good old symphonies from the olden days, which he didn't do anymore later. And it is also inspired by a principle of unifying a work of four movements by using the same melodies or themes or thematic material through the four movements. And it's a gem. And I thought, well, let me try it with my, not even quote, my Singapore Orchestra now. And I'm very happy that they had about the same reaction. It's, just to say, it's very difficult. It's written for four solos, and it's a huge, beautiful, joyful challenge for the orchestra to play. And uh, I added a double bass line, so it really sounds like a string orchestra. This process of adding the double bass line that you did to the music, what special things did you bring into the writing of that uh, extra line? When four people play together, they are very close and listen to each other and play this piece for weeks and weeks to rehearse it. Sometimes you feel it's like soaring, and sometimes to feel that in an orchestra of 20 people, you might have sometimes a little point in the middle of the bar. So this empty spot, I dared filling with a little double bass accent. Ooh. And it makes a little bit more of contour. Tell us about the other WC that we are doing and uh, with our very special harp player, uh, Gulia. Given the fact that we are, under these special circumstances, allowed to have, let's say, 15, 16, 17 string players on stage with masks, we were thinking what else could we do meaningfully. And I had the idea which was given to me by listening to the SSO CD, to do the dances for strings and harp. Debussy had written that for the Conservatoire for, to be the propagandist of a new type of harp, which finally didn't survive, the chromatic harp. So he showed on this harp everything you can play on a piano, and which was deemed unthinkable for harp players with seven strings. You can't do, like for all musicians amidst you, is, C, D, E, F, but there's no C, C sharp, D, D sharp, missing. So you can't play all combinations. And with this chromatic harp you could, but it was so difficult because double amount of strings, you were puzzled, the two fingers didn't work. So the harp players with the old fashioned harp learned so much, improved so much to be able to play this wonderful piece. And your Gulnara, Gulia, as they call them, lovingly, has recorded it remarkably well, and I thought you have such an asset, such a, a jewel, so why not playing these absolutely beautiful dances? They are written ten years later. The first dance is called Danse Sacré, Holy Dance, very dignified, and the other is Danse Profane, which means the worldly dance. And it's full of sweetness and full of brilliant show-off moments for the harp. And for the orchestra, it's just to be the loving servants 
of this breakable instrument. You please do not play too loud. The harp is like a guitar. It doesn't sound for 30, 50, 90 meters. But when you have it as a soloist, you just carry it on loving hands. Now that we had uh, a piece for strings, we also have a piece for winds. So they came in and we played this beautiful piece by Antonin Dvorak, his serenade for wind instruments. The serenade is in four movements. The first movement is a march, a friendly march. Like light. Then comes a minuet with a fabulously difficult, brilliant trio. Then comes the slow movement, which could be a symphony movement. And then the finale is a very quick dance into the ton dun tick the pom pom faster than a polka. The music is pure Dvorak. And there's nothing to say, this is one of the most gifted melodic, harmonic, formal just great composers and Brahms said this young man is so gifted that other composers would be happy to snatch the bits he wipes from his desk. <laughs> Music he eliminated would make other composers happy. The wind players in a symphony like Beethoven's or Brahms they play often and you don't even notice that sometimes they don't. Now they're all on their own they are alone, so they have to play the whole time, which is utterly tiring if you are not used very much to that. So the horns and the bassoons play for five minutes. It's very difficult to maintain a, a level of concentration and quality which is required. It's possible, and it's, it's done. Nevertheless, all these players, even if it's heavy and difficult, adore to play. And it's the most beautiful thing after four months of isolation to get together and play together. What we have now is a surprise to me and to many of you, which I would never have expected. And it's just lovely to announce our special guest, who will talk to you now. Hi, um, my name is Marketa Dvořák, and I'm the great-great-granddaughter of the composer Antonín Dvořák. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm, I was born and raised in the Czech Republic um, and um, I've been living in Singapore for the last five years together with my husband who is Singaporean and I'm also the mother of Antonin Dvořák the sixth who is currently four years old um, starting to be a musician himself. Um, I grew up in Czech Republic or it was Czechoslovakia back then um, and it was communist and the communists didn't really promote uh, the work of my great-great-grandfather. So growing up I didn't really know, uh, I didn't really realize how, what an important uh, composer he had been. And actually uh, there was a minister of culture in, during communism in the 60s. Uh, his, uh, his name was Nayedli and he basically said something, something to the extent that Dvořák's music is like a stone that every musician has to push away and he was really against my Push music. away? Yes. Has to try to climb? Yeah, <laughs> and it's amazing. So he was basically behind not, uh, not promoting uh, Dvořák's music because Dvořák had spent time in America and that was the main oh, reason. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I was astonished you by mentioning that the Czech Republic, or the, the Czechoslovakia, the Wakia, had not paid attention to Dvořák enough. That might be right if you have the real situation outside. Of course, Dvorak is the bread and butter on every Czech musician's mm, yeah. music table. And the Czech Philharmonic is kind of the heirs of this. Mm. And even there, I think that more than Smetana, who was developing Czech mm. language in music, he is the soul and body of Czech music worldwide. Thank God he was so prolific. Mm. Grandfather was very tight to Prague and even going to America was a big deal. That was just because of my great-great-grandmother who made him sign the contract. They went, but otherwise he was really happy staying at, in Prague and at the family summer house. He wouldn't have he gone anywhere. He was very happy staying outside of Prague. Yeah, outside of Prague is the village. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just want to stay in the village. Um, <laughs> 
and yeah. that you feel in this music. Yes. It's not a big city's music, it's a big country's mm, music. Country's music, yeah. And he loved trains, so whenever we, he was in Prague, and even in New York, uh, basically, great-great-grandfather always went woke, woke up early in the morning and he went to the train station. And he knew every train conductor. Interesting that you call conductor orchestra conductor yeah, yeah, and train it's about conductor. The same. <laughs> He knew every train conductor, and then one, at one point he said, "I would give all my symphonies if I had to invent the locomotive." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is noble, noble faith in a good future. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm very, very glad that we are back in the concert hall, recording new digital productions of music, old and new, and we are sure that. As you continue following us on Cystic Live, the new platform that we're using for our digital concerts, you will be finding lots of wonderful music that can keep you company on Saturday nights. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts of everyone here at the Singapore Symphony Orchestra to you for staying with us and following us all these months. <laughs>